Corn produces about 200 gallons per acre. And quite frankly, as a solar product, this sucks. This is like nothing like what, what we can get from the amount of solar energy hitting that field. So the book you know, goes into 40 different crops for different climates that are good energy crops compared to corn. Um, I, and I'm going to get around to why corn is even grown in a minute, but, but let's look at some of the alternatives. And this is, this is very exciting from a getting rid of the monoculture point of view, because if there's other valuable crops to grow, farmers can make more money, although they're conservative and resistant to change in general, there's nothing like a good bottom line to, to get the discussion going. You know, we never used to grow soybeans in this country, and when soybeans got introduced, it was only five years till it was 40% of all the farmland in the United States. So when farmers catch on to something, it goes. So 200 gallons per acre. Now, in different climates, different things are better for making alcohol. If you're down in Louisiana, or if you're in Florida, or even Southern California, there's new kinds of sugar cane, which will yield 1,800 gallons per acre. There's sugar beets, which will grow all the way up to Canada and into Canada, and also what we call fodder beets, which are slightly different, which will yield up around 1,300 plus gallons per acre. Now, I did some work 20 years ago with um, Dave Hall and Steve Wilbur up at the Arcata Marsh Project. Everybody here know what that is? It's the sewage treatment for, for Arcata. They use cattails, okay, as the basic idea to take all the nutrients out of the secondary sewage and suck all those nutrients up into the cattails so that the water coming out at the end of the marsh is cleaner than the water coming out of the streams out of the National Forest. Because cattails are these incredible biofilters. They'll just suck up all the nutrients. Now, we did, and this was back 20 years ago when they were just getting the growing of those down, we calculated that we could do 2,500 gallons per acre, and that was only on two, two cuttings a year, two crops a year. You can get up to four in a warm climate like California, cattails. Indians used to use the bases of cattails, because they're almost pure starch, to make bread. So cattails are extremely efficient photosynthesizers, and they are practically hydroponic because of the way they grow in, you know, in a nutrient solution. So somebody asked about municipalities. Well, every municipality has, see in permaculture, we, I should back up and say we never say that there's a waste. Waste is not the right word. We say that there are surpluses that are not properly directed, you know. So, you know, cities and small towns have all this sewage, which is really an incredible resource, which is surplus, usually. And so, now we're talking about the kind of economic benefit from operating the sewage treatment in a biological way that could power all the city vehicles and get rid of the need to buy petroleum on a city basis. This integrates well with laws, which I'll explain later. There are many other crops that fit in this. Fodder beets, by the way, in, in fact, in Europe in general, they don't feed grain very much to their, especially their dairy cattle in the winter. They feed beets. They have huge partially underground buildings where they stack up the beets and they feed the beets all winter to the cattle. We get way more milk than we get you know, from grain. I'll, I'll get to why grain is happening, because the more you hear about it, you know, why are we growing grain? Everybody else does something different. It's, it's not a good reason. So. Um, there's many other crops. Jerusalem artichokes. Jerusalem. I've got a cold. I can't spell when I have a cold. Jerusalem artichokes, which have nothing to, Jeru to do with Jerusalem or artichokes. They're a sunflower plant native of the United States, have no pests that have ever been detected. They produce a huge amount of carbohydrate in tubers below the ground. And those tubers uh, are a carbohydrate called inulin, not insulin, but inulin, which nowadays, for the first time, we have cheap enzymes to break down into sugar, and we can go ahead and make alcohol from those. Jerusalem artichokes can do about 1,600 gallons per acre. So we have a lot of different choices. You get out to uh, 
Christ, you get out in Texas, you can grow pimelons, which are, or buffalo gourds, which are these desert plants that need almost no water, and they make these huge fruits that are full of carbohydrate and seeds. You can make biodiesel and alcohol from them. The oil can be made into biodiesel, and the carbohydrate can make seven, 800 gallons per acre. So in some places, you can get two crops a year. There's a project going in in Southern California, which is going to grow one crop of sugar cane in the summer, and it's going to grow beets in the winter, and they're going to get over 2,000 gallons per acre. So the reason why I bring all these alternative crops up, if you're a, a co-op in, in Indiana, and you're, you've been growing corn forever, and you finally built your alcohol plant, which they've done, and you're making money on the alcohol, and you're selling a little bit of money for the carbon dioxide and the dry distiller screens, at some point you're going to realize that you're not a corn grower, you're an energy producer. And you're going to say, gee, is there something other than corn I should be running through this plant? And there's, farmers need to be educated about what the economic alternatives are. But for these other crops, are there still those benefits, like the, um, you're saying the natural um, herbicides? Oh, herbicides? I have no idea. And probably not because it's corn protein. But these crops also use a tiny amount of fertilizer compared to corn. They just don't need much. And they also have far less pests. The other thing about this is that change to the pest issue is that the minute you start growing a multiplicity of crops, the bugs get confused. Because monoculture, for those of you who maybe not have thought about this before, if you grow many square miles of corn and you're a corn borer, you are in heaven. Okay? Because you're, there's just nothing but food as far as you can see and you reproduce like crazy. But if you're out there and this field is corn and that's beets and that's sorghum and you know, that's Jerusalem artichokes, you don't have the endless buffet that you otherwise would have and your, the tendency for your population to get out of control drops dramatically and the need to try to battle those bugs drops away as well. So one of our key you know, strategies in organic farming is multiplicity of crops and crop rotation to keep the bugs guessing. And it works pretty well. It's worked worked forever until we started growing monoculture. So this, you know, diversifying our energy crops also can break the stranglehold that the, uh, that the uh, chemical companies have on farmers because without, you know, massive monoculture, the need for pesticides drops to nothing. And believe me, if you're an oil company and you can sell pesticides for $80 a pound compared to selling gasoline for 15 cents a pound, wholesale, you can bet the oil companies would rather sell pesticides. Okay. And in fact, in fact, when it comes to petroleum nowadays, this is going to sound very familiar to you. <laughs>